Live in our studios, the hardworking district attorney of Brooklyn, Charles Joe Hines. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you very much for having me, Jeff. Always good to be with you and speak directly to your listeners. We, can, we should make it a weekly habit. Uh, <laughs> once I get past this campaign, that would be a good idea. How's the campaign going? Is it uh, something the paper seems to be saying that it's a tougher one than usual? I don't know which campaign they're watching. I mean, I had a tough campaign in 05 because, you, you know, you don't indict the county chairman and not have a real problem. Uh, this is not a tough campaign. Uh, we, uh, I have two candidates who have never run, uh, have never had a supervisory position in their former government jobs. Uh, I, th I think uh, the, the, the public more and more is seeing that it's just not a good idea to try and give someone an opportunity to run a DA's office with 1,400 employees, including 1,400 employees, 500 lawyers, and a budget of $60 million to someone who's never supervised anything. So it's a very, very good feel out there. I do a lot of subway stops. I, I go to the uh, you know Wingate Field Monday night. Uh, I go to uh, Seaside, you know, the, the Markowitz concerts. And the reception is very, very good. So it's, it's, it's a good race for us. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very confident. I'm not take nothing for granted. I work very, very hard. And I run, I run as if I was had a real race. You know, what may make it exciting, because it really depends on how many voters come out. Primary days don't always get the big turnout, but when you have Anthony Weiner and Elliot Spitzer the, duking out in their prospective races, it makes it a more exciting race where more people come to the polls, right? Also, you know, we have a lot of councilmatic races, and, and that will bring people to the polls. In addition, we have a great get-out-the-vote uh, uh, plan uh, all over Brooklyn. And we're, we're going to have people who never really voted before. I mean, people in uh, the Middle East and uh, from Middle Eastern countries, you know, and we've been involved in a unity task force, which has put together representatives from, the, from uh, Pakistan and from Bangladesh with uh, Jewish groups and Christian groups. We've had uh, this unity task force since 2000. So, we are really concentrating on getting a group of voters who had not come out before. I expect a very heavy vote from the Russian community. You know, I've been doing Russian radio uh, with two separate hosts for seven years. Uh, a very good Chinese uh, turnout. I've been doing Chinese radio for seven years. So I, I really took a page out of Bill Clinton's uh, playbook many years ago by going directly to uh, indigenous groups. That's why it's always a delight to be with you and with... Uh, uh, but in this program, you don't need a translator, though. No, I don't. No. Because <laughs> no. you know a couple of Yiddish words you can throw in. A few. A few. <laughs> Abyssal. Abyssal, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a good campaign. By the way, I happen to like the idea about doing a lot of ethnic, especially in a place like New York, because the fact is New York's such an ethnic place, and when you do the regular media, it doesn't really cover all the ethnic bases. No, so by doing the Chinese, the Russians, the other ethnic groups, I think it's a great way to go because they pay more attention to somebody speaking to them if somebody takes a time out than somebody just speaking to the general public. There is little, little doubt about that, and, and that's really why in, in 05 I got an enormous vote from the Russian community. So. Uh, we're on the right track. We, uh, you know, we are, are getting a great deal of uh, broad support. For example, Central Brooklyn, which is largely African American, uh, every uh, African American district leader is with us. Uh, so it, it's going to be, I, I think, a, um, a very satisfying result on September the 10th. Let's talk to Jews. Good. Jewish Week had an article earlier about Sam Kellner, whistleblower. Right. Your office was going after him, right. and they're saying you should drop. Tov Heiken came out saying everything should be dropped. What's going on with him? Well, you know, I've been a trial lawyer for my entire career, and I measure cases based on that experience. I've taught trial advocacy for 25 years. Um, you know, Jewish Week has its own bent. Uh, this uh, one particular reporter who doesn't like me, you know. Is that Hella Winston? Yeah, I'm sad to say she doesn't like me. And when, whenever she gets a chance, she takes a shot. Um, the Kellner case is going to trial. I'm not going to discuss the specifics of it, but it's going to trial. And it has nothing to do with Leibowitz, for example, which is the way they, you know, they try and connect the Leibowitz case. Leibowitz is going to go to trial also. And, uh, you know, the, the jury will decide... Uh, the merits of the case. But we're, we're confident we have the case. And they say he's a whistleblower and that he's being penalized for being a whistleblower and that uh, it's, they say and they say that he should not be going to trial. 
I know what they say, but I have a responsibility to bring a case where I believe there was a substantial effort by Mr. Kellner to, uh, to, uh, to gain money uh, for his own benefit by making up stories. And I think we have a substantial case. When is it scheduled to go to trial? I would think probably sometime in the fall. Um, the, the case has been lingering for almost two years, and every adjournment has been sought by Kellner's lawyers. Uh, we asked for an adjournment the last time because we have, uh, we have something to investigate which is unrelated to the core charges of Kellner, but it's, it's, it's a peripheral issue that has to be resolved. So that was our, only, that was our first adjournment. So I think we're probably looking at a trial in October and November. And the Leibowitz trial? It's, I think, if I'm not, it's, it's going to be in September, actually. Yeah. For everyone, that's a child, a, an alleged child molester who is being retried. Yeah, he was tried. He was convicted the first time. He got a substantial jail sentence, and he will be retried, I believe it's the second week in September. Any other trials that are dealing with this issue uh, coming up? You know, we, we, have a, we have a trial ready office, so we're always trying cases. And there are do any specific cases involving the ultra Orthodox Jews right now, not, not off the top of my head, but, you know, we're always on trial. Because I remember you mentioned to me that there may be another 100 potential perpetrators out there in the community. If I said that, I misspoke. I, I, I don't really estimate. I mean, what I have said is that I don't believe for a moment that uh, the, that the, uh, the, the problems of, of sex uh, abuse uh, are pervasive in the ultra-Orthodox community any, any more than I believe, believe it was pervasive in the Catholic priests. And so I think <clears throat> what is happening is that more and more folks come forward directly to us so that we can work with them. Uh, I think there's a comfort level that's being reached, and I think we'll be able to to show definitively that any claim that uh, is, you know somehow ultra ultra orthodox uh, people are, are more inclined to, for sexual perversion just doesn't have any weight. No, it's true. The, I'm sure the numbers are not any greater than in the general population. But if I remember correctly, I think those that are being pursued by your office or their folk for potential being a perpetrator, sexual I predator. Know, I, know what, I know what you're getting at. We have pending 118 cases. That's what I was referring to. We had, I'm sorry, we had 118 cases. We resolved half of them. Uh, we have had a 73 uh, conviction rate, 73 percent. And, and then there are other cases building up. Now, you mentioned that you're getting more cooperation, and I'd like to focus on that because there's still, you probably hear it, there's don't talk, don't tell, and yes, there is more rabbis saying you should cooperate, but you still have some that don't allow their constituents to cooperate. They feel that it should be handled internally. And, and I think it's a mistake, and I've said it over and over again. That, How do you change it? Uh, you, the only way you can change it is, is to re require them to be mandated reporters, and, you know, it may come to that. Now... I thought the leadership in the uh, the Crown Height the Besden last summer was uh, uh, took a great step forward when uh, they suggested that uh, any uh, allegations be brought direct, directly directly to secular authorities, and if we can get other um, uh, communities to follow, I, I think it'll be a, it'll be a very very positive step forward. So I was saying, I alluded to an interesting Democratic primary race with Elliot Spitzer and Anthony Weiner. I'm curious to know, I know you're not making endorsements, but I'm curious to know if had that, I know. I'm just saying, what do you think about the fact of them entering the race, considering their moral challenge that they've had and entering the race and what it does for politics in general? Yeah, I, I, look, I think it's uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's up to the voters to decide. That's, that's what, we, what's what makes our democracy so great. And, you know, both of them have their, their strengths, uh, irrespective of, of their uh, uh, moral foibles that they've, uh, you know, conceded to. Uh, and then it'll, it'll be a question for the voters to decide uh, who's the more qualified person to be the, the uh, controller and who's the more qualified person to be the mayor. Does the poll show them ahead in both those races? Uh, the most recent poll, I think, had Anthony in second place. Uh, Elliot, of course, is clearly out front by 15 points. But, I mean, I think Scott Stringer is a, uh, a tough guy. Uh, I think you're going to see a, a much more aggressive campaign. And then, you know, people don't really pay a heck of a lot of attention uh, to these races uh, in July and August. It'll start to to um, uh, you know, heat up at, you know, toward the end of August as we get toward Labor Day. 
Live in our studio, Charles Joe Hines, the District Attorney of Brooklyn. We'll be right back after these messages. Stay tuned. Don't go away. Welcome back to the program. I'm Zev Brenner, live in our studios. He does every three weeks now. It's Charles Joe Hines, the District Attorney of Brooklyn, looking to be a seventh term as District Attorney. So I know you've been there a long time. What do you hope to accomplish in a seventh term should you be elected? You know, I'm not finished yet, and that's really why I'm running. Uh, you know, just quickly to remind people, in 1990, when I had the privilege of getting this job, there were about 158,000 serious felonies in Brooklyn. Uh, 760 murders. One out of every 15 of us was the victim of a serious crime. And Brooklyn had become the fifth most violent place in the country. Uh, 13 years later, Money Magazine said we're one of the 10 best places to live. Now, that did not happen because of a traditional prosecutor's approach. It happened because I recognized that there was much that can be done about reducing reoffending rates. And so we started the first drug treatment program in the country. Uh, in 1999, that was in 1999, I had the first reentry program for the formerly incarcerated. Both of those programs have contributed substantially to the reduction in serious crime, so that we today average under 30,000 serious crimes. Uh, last year we had uh, less than 150 murders for the first time since 1960. So we're on the right track. A couple things I want to accomplish. During the last uh, two terms, I was able to put together a Red Hook Community Court, a multi-jurisdictional court that has a, a full range of services. Um, it is credited with taking Red Hook, which was one of the most dangerous places in the city, and making it one of the most safest places. Brownsville, arguably, is still one of the toughest places, although not nearly as bad as it was. It's getting better, surprisingly, right? It's getting much better. And I believe that the miracle of Red Hook, as we call it, will be the miracle of Brownsville. We're going to be up and running with that court in two years. We've been working with the Center for Court Innovation for the last three years. And I believe once the success of Brownsville is established, we'll be able to convince the court system and the, the mayor and the city council to reverse a decision made many years ago, which I always believe was just wrong, and that was the centralizing of courts. We used to have local courts everywhere in New York City, magistrates' courts, special sessions, sessions, special sessions courts, municipal courts. When they centralized the system, all the credibility went downtown in the five counties of New York City. We have to change that. The other thing, I'm, Was it to save money that they did it originally? They thought it would be more efficient to save money, and they just did not factor in the credibility problem. And it, 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 you know, over the years, it's been, been pretty serious. So I, that's a, a major thing I want to try and accomplish. The other thing is we o offer this reentry program for the people coming home from prison. The recidivism rate or reoffending rate for people being released from prison, this is the national average, is six out of ten within three years of release are rearrested, half go back to prison. In our program, validated by Harvard University uh, back in, 19, in 2007, it's two out of ten. I believe we can reduce that even further. Our problem is we can only offer the service to a thousand of the three thousand coming home to Brooklyn. If I can get the resources within the next two years of my new term uh, to offer that to everybody, we will see a significant rise in public safety for Brooklyn. So that's exciting. How much money do you have to raise for that? You know, it's, it's peanuts when you think about it. It costs $2,200 per client to give them the resources. If someone fails, as they frequently do if they don't have these services, and a return to prison, of course, is sixty-four thousand dollars. It's so should we know, Brandy, Just a one non-return, you ready? Can sponsor at least uh, twenty. Would that you were in charge of the budget, you know, because <laughs> you understood it immediately. So that it, those are a couple, of, a couple of things I want to accomplish, and then you know, uh, uh, I think we will that, then be on track to have institutionalized programs that. When the day comes, I do leave. S someone will understand that it would be foolhardy to change any of these institutional approaches to public safety. You mentioned before you got in 1990, the mm -hmm. famous riots in the Crown in 1991. Yeah. Yeah. Former Mayor David Zinger just co is coming out with a book any day now where he seems to put the blame not on him but on the police commissioner. You were there at that time since it's coming out. that's talking about it. I'd like to get your recollections. I think it was a very, very painful period for David Dinkins, who I think is a decent man. I think he was a very, very good mayor. Uh, you know, the contrary is, is thought because 
uh, all of the cops that uh, that were hired after he left. And people forget the fact that it was David Dinkins who was the one responsible for safe streets, safe cities. He convinced the legislature to provide the resources so we could basically double the force. Um, I think I look back at Crown Heights uh, and I, I think of a deputy chief who went to the 7-1 precinct in the second day of the riot and addressed the women and men of the 7-1. And he said, you're doing a great job. And I said to my people, that is a terrible mistake because this deputy chief was African-American. And what I was saying to the white police officers was, you're, you're, on, the, you're on the right track. What really happened, of course, is that Mayor Dinkins, I think the third day, visited the area and someone threw a rock at him. And that ended the Crown Heights riots because the police department put all the resources necessary to turn it around. It was a sad day for us because it was a pogrom in every sense, or appeared to be a pogrom. And, you know, you think about what's happened since 1991, things have changed dramatically. We have much more diversity in, in the city, certainly in Brooklyn. Uh, there's an intermingling of people. Now, you know, we all keep to ourselves, I guess, in, in one sense, but there's an intermingling in the workplace. There is a comfort level in the workplace with uh, every, all spectrums of the Jewish community, the black community, the Latino community. We are, we are we, I think we glory in our diversity. And I, I doubt very much if, if something like Crown Heights could ever happen again. But there's still tensions you have in Williamsburg tensions because the truth is when you have a bad economy and you have – we're talking before about housing in Manhattan. But even in Williamsburg, you have different groups fighting for affordable housing. You have Hispanic groups, Hasidic groups. So that lends, le leads itself to tension. And I'm sure you may have that in Crown Heights to a lesser degree. So when you have that, then a shrinking pine. So that leads to tension. I'm not sure what's – hopefully there's a lot of dialogue going on, but you, from time to time you see that tension simmer, which and could go into a much bigger conflagration. And I think what's different today than it was now is that the tension, the, the poverty level, has not translated into an increase in crime. The tension has not led to the kind of violence that was so, you know, so, so much of a worry for me in the late 80s and early 90s. And it has very much to do with the fact that communities are speaking. They, they are, um, the dialogue has been, been open. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to have uh, disagreements, uh, for example, after the, the, the uh, Zimmerman verdict. There was a great deal of dis disagreement and anxiety uh, pitting the African-American community against the white community. I think uh, the white community was at 51 percent was satisfied with the verdict, 37 percent was not. The black community was 87 percent dissatisfied. And yet I think there has not been, the, in Los Angeles, there was one serious problem recently. But we have not seen that reflected anywhere else in urban America, which is a good thing. So despite some protests here and there, it's been relatively quiet in New York? It's been very, very safe, very peaceful. And that's the way it should be. We should be able to talk th things through rather than, than hurt each other. But getting back to 1991, the fact that the police didn't crack down and let the protesters rage led to the killing of Yankov Rosemann, led to the hooliganisms on the streets, and led to chaos, which only was corrected on the third day. So... Mm -hmm. In a sense, is it fair to blame just the police commissioner, or should the mayor have done something differently in 1991? It's, I think there's enough blame to go around. But I, I think that in his heart of heart, David Lincoln thought he was doing the right thing. And when he recognized just how horrible it was that one day when he was out uh, visiting the scene, uh, that brought things to an end. We will never see that again, I don't believe. Charles Johannes, District Attorney of Brooklyn, thank you for joining us again. Always good to be with you, sir. I look forward to the next meeting. Thank you. Great.